Hello, you guys. Happy Saturday. Welcome to our book chat day. I see Brittany is already here. Wonderful. What a fantastic book we have to start off 2021. Oh my gosh. Hello. Hi. How are you? You can hear me okay? Yes. How about me? Yep, I can hear you fine. Let me move this back a little bit. It's always making me okay. Perfect. I'm gonna give people a little bit more time to join. You look so beautiful. Thank you. I cannot wait to talk about I have my tissue too, just in case. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> hey, Donnie. Hi, Donna. Donnie. So, I just can't. And you're in Dallas, right? I'm in Nashville this weekend. Oh, OK. My, yeah. my, my family's from Murfreesboro. Really? Yeah, and I used to live in Dallas. Actually, I used to live in Carrollton. Really? Oh, yeah. So, so all the places that you're talking about, it's just very familiar to me. So divine. Yes. Hello, Andrea. So I guess we'll kick it off because I want to get right into it. I don't want to waste not one single minute with you. Um, welcome to our Spine of the Month book chat. I'm Jamise, and I'm AKA Spines Vines, and I'm thrilled to have Br Brittany K. Barnett joining me today. She is the author of A Knock at Midnight, A Story of Hope, Justice, and Freedom. Um, this book was, I can see why. It, all these awards, all these accolades, um, Amazon's best book of 2020, named one of the best books of by the year from Kirkus Reviews. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I mean, how has it been for you? I'm going to do a little bio on you really quick, and then we'll dive right in. But um, I just want to say welcome. And anyone that has any questions, I won't forget the questions this time. Sometimes I get so deep into the conversation, <laughs> I forget to ask the questions. So just ping me or remind me if I didn't get to the questions. But Brittany K. Barnett, is an award-winning attorney and entrepreneur focused on social impact investing. I love that. She is dedicated to transforming the criminal justice system and has won freedom from numerous clients serving life sentences for federal drug offenses, seven of whom received executive clemency from President Barack Obama. Barnett has founded several nonprofits and social enterprises such as Buried Alive Project, Girls Embracing Mothers, 16 Capital Partners. Is it Melina? Melina? Melina. Melina Rain LLC. She has earned many honors, including being named um, America's outstanding young America's outstanding young lawyers by the American Bar Association. Wow! Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is a stunning book. I I don't think I've read a book that has impacted me um, on this subject matter as much since I read Just Mercy. Um, can you share with us just a little bit um, about the book and then we'll talk a little bit about the inspiration behind um, writing your memoir and telling these stories? Absolutely. So my book, A Knock at Midnight, A Story of Hope, Justice and Freedom, it really follows my journey of understanding injustice in the courts, of discovering genius behind bars and just how the journey transformed the definition of freedom. For mm -hmm. You know, and so I wrote the book for a variety of reasons, the main one being to tell the truth. I just wanted to tell the truth about racial injustice that bleeds through this nation's criminal legal system. I wanted to tell the truth about the people, the heartbeats, yes, cars, and just how they are sons and daughters and mothers and fathers. And, you know, it, there's this third reason that I wrote the book that's kind of an outlier, but is really one of the most important to me. And it's I wrote the book for young girls of color from the South. Mm -hmm. And just hopes that they can see themselves in me and whatever their biggest dream is mm -hmm. to go for it. I know um, you talk a lot about being from East Texas um, mm -hmm. and your journey and just your childhood and how, how has that really shaped you into you know, your dreams, because I think at first you were saying that you wanted to be a lawyer, then you didn't want to be a lawyer because you had never really seen that in your community. Right. You know, I grew up in a small piece of rural East Texas, and we didn't have any lawyers in our community, especially any lawyers who looked like me. I grew up wanting to be Claire Huxtable. 
from the you know she was the closest person to a lawyer i knew and unfortunately growing up in situations where there's no representation Mm -hmm. i honestly in high school started thinking that becoming a lawyer was completely out of my league something that i couldn't obtain Mm -hmm. and i i realized it's because i didn't know any and just knowing how important it is to be able to to see to see it you know and so it definitely was uh epitomizes the need for representation. yes yes and i saw that like throughout the book mm-hmm. um you talked about i want to talk a little bit about balancing your career because you know we see the we see the growth i'm we're gonna do i'm gonna do my we're doing our best not to give away anything oh my phone is like going dark hold on one second i don't know can you am i clear to you yeah okay it's just dark to me um you talk a lot about you know balancing your career and then the pro bono work that you're doing so how do you how do you do that you know without burning out it it seemed like if i had to stop to think about it everything just would have Yes. you know mm-hmm. so driven just doing what i was supposed to do you know yes. i tell a story in the book of my of my beloved grandpa you know being from the south yes i don't think any person can give a story and have those words of wisdom like somebody from the south so my yes grandpa, i remember being like in the fourth or fifth grade and telling him I had made all A's on my report card, you know, and one of my friends was getting like money for each A she got. And <laughs> my grandpa, daddy. And I was like, daddy, you know, my friend got all A's for every uh, $5 for every A. Like, what are you going to give me? And he said, I'm not going to give you anything. And I was crushed because my grandpa <laughs> never told me no. And he said, I'm not going to give you anything for doing what you're supposed to do. Yes. Yeah, And I think the way I balanced it was doing what what I felt I was supposed to do. And climbing the corporate ladder was something that was a dream of mine. You know, mm-hmm. I, I climbed the corporate ladder, be a corporate lawyer. And getting people out of prison became an obsession. Yes. Almost. That I was doing both, working on corporate deals by day, getting people free by night, pro bono, and just doing what I was – felt I was supposed to do and that's what that's what empowered me it's just so remarkable I just I listened to the audiobook um a few days ago Mm -hmm. and I had read the book earlier um at the end of 2020 Mm -hmm. and I just I I mean just your passion and your dedication is just something and I cried a lot I mean on certain times you know just when you when you were having your um celebrating your victories you know it was it was just so remarkable to me just the work that you were doing and so I want to go to the moment that changed your life you were in law school mm-hmm. and you came across a case and can you talk about that yeah we're gonna try not to give it but a lot of it is already in kind of like yeah. the yeah, yeah so okay in law school I came across a case of a woman named Sharonda Jones so I'm in law school and I'm taking this critical race theory course that analyzes the intersection between race and the law And I'm talking about how these drug laws got into place, how racially biased they are. But I wanted to show the heartbeat. Like I wanted real stories because I knew a person who was serving life for drugs. Mm -hmm. A young man named Keon Mitchell, who was 23 years old when he got kidnapped by the federal government, you know, but Texas. So I'm thinking that's just his case is an anomaly. That's just good old boy, rural East Texas justice. I'm not knowing there's this larger issue out here, but I knew I wanted to include a woman in my paper because my mom had been to prison Mm -hmm. across the case of Sharonda Jones from a Google search. And she's a black woman from the rural South like me. And I just saw so much of myself in her, you know, Mm -hmm. time she was serving her 10th year of a life without parole sentence. And it was just mind blowing for me. It was, I was angry. Yes, it makes you angry. How does she get life? Right. You know, for drugs and and the way she did through how these laws are being implemented, you know, it was just, it wasn't fair at Mm -hmm. all. And, you know, her case just tugged at my soul. 
Yeah, I think um, in the opening two pages, when you talk about, uh, it, it crushed me. I, I said, okay, this is gonna, this one's gonna do me in because <laughs> when you say how she left her purse in the back because she knew she would be right back and never came back. I just, I, I mean, literally that was like so much. Um, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. That right then and there, I knew. I said, "This book is going to be a doozy." Um, but you talked about also um, in speaking about being unjust because you said that your mom, you know, she got put in jail for something that she was doing to her body and not to anyone else, to herself, and she got you know this sentence because of something that she was doing to herself. Yes. And so, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So my mom had a drug addiction, and her drug addiction really started to spiral more out of control once my sister and I graduated high school, you know. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, she caught a case. It was an assault case while she was high. Um, she slapped someone, you know, mm -hmm. put on probation. But the conditions of probation, she couldn't uphold the part about not indulging in any illegal activity as it comes to substance abuse. Right. And she kept failing her drug tests over and over. She never, my mom's never been in trouble before. That was her first run in with the law. She never committed another crime. She just kept failing her drug test. And instead of rehabilitation that she so desperately needed, she was punished. Yes. The prison, you know. And fortunately, my mom found that will and determination within herself. I always say my mom became sober in spite of prison, not because yes. of it. Yes. And it's because it's because she found that will within herself. So that brings me to um, my next thoughts on being punished, because I look at just in, in this book as well as like, you know, crack and co crack versus opioids and mm -hmm. how it's how it's addressed, how it's um, different messaging within the media, because, mm -hmm. you know, when crack was ravaging black communities, you know, Black people were criminalized for it. Yeah. They were put in jail for years. But now you have something that is ravishing white communities, white rural communities, and now it's an epidemic. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I just talk a little bit about the difference in the disparities and how they treat, because now people are getting medical help. They're not being put in jail as much as Black people were back with 80s, 90s, late 80s, 90s, 2000, early yeah. 2000. Yeah. You're Right. And it's a great point to bring up. And I, I say all the time in this day and age, you know, I am not wasting time arguing about these laws being racist in this country. That is beyond legitimate debate. Right. You know, and when the opioid crisis hit, it's being treated rightfully so as a public health crisis because it yes. is. Mm -hmm. as you mentioned, when crack cocaine was ravaging black communities, it was criminalized users and dealers were demonized in a way that they were being punished. I mean, mm -hmm. we still have people in prison for the past 30 years, you know, yes. even though these laws are changing and criminal justice reform is popular, it's fashionable, it's a hot topic right now, but it's just so surprising to me just how little people still know about how the system actually works. And mm -hmm. that's book gets across teaching the law through story in a way that helps resonate that this is wrong mm -hmm. i haven't directly been impacted but i will say this every, this book I, every time i read something of this nature i learn so much more so i can appreciate what i'm learning and i know what i see um just how things are the messages are given to us mm -hmm. um, and so i i'm very appreciative of you you know just putting real faces and you said something i don't know if i have the quote um i know i have it you said something about you know not looking past the number and looking at the heartbeat that these are these are people yes yeah um now i want to talk about uh the flawed justice system the war on drugs yes <laughs> <laughs> and the 1986 drug use act and the mandatory sentencing laws. So there were cases where the judges may didn't want to give the people give them life, but they had to because of a mandatory sentencing laws. Yeah, yeah. So in 1986, this anti-drug abuse act was passed, and it implemented mandatory minimums. It implemented this 100 to one ratio between powder cocaine and crack cocaine.
And what that means is you have 500 grams of powder cocaine. I could have only five grams of crack, but we're going to receive the same sentence in prison. And it's not lost on anybody that, in the, especially in the late 80s, more affluent white people were using powder cocaine and crack cocaine was running rampant through black communities. And this created such a disproportionality in sentencing to the fact that over 80% of people in federal prison today are black and brown for drug mm -hmm. cases. You know, and so it's just a reality that cannot and should not be ignored. And so I know a lot of people understand mandatory minimums, but they may not understand that it does tie a judge's hand, like in the case of Chris Young that I mentioned in the book. So Chris Young was 22 years old, ultimately sentenced to a mandatory minimum of life without parole. And it was under the three strikes law which means your third drug felony is a mandatory life. There's nothing the judge can do. But Chris, what it doesn't show you is that when I think of life for drugs, I think of cartels. I mm -hmm. think of violent drug traffic. You know, I think of, of international drug trade. Yes. What it doesn't show you is what cases like Chris Young's represent of like Chris's two priors. One, he grew up in a suffocating level of poverty that no child in America should have to endure. Two, one of his priors, he was 18. The other, he was 19. And the quantity for both of those priors weighed less than three pennies, the drug quantity. Even still, with his third drug felony, it was a mandatory life. And Judge Sharp, in the case, spoke out about it. He did not want to sentence Christian to fundamentally a fundamental death sentence, which is what it is, because there's no parole in the federal system. And mm -hmm. so that prime example of a case where the judge's hands were tied and that to me is unconscionable you know right or it's just morally and economically irresponsible that we have laws in this country the great part about that is the first step act of 2018 changed that mm -hmm. it's not mandatory life anymore it's mandatory 25 years which is still a long time very and priors have to be serious the problem with that is that law is not retroactive. So people that, right, so it doesn't apply to people that have been sentenced it's under the, yeah, and I wonder why is that? I mean, I just think that black people, especially black men, and I'm not discounting black women, but a black, we're just not, they're not given the grace that other people are extended. And I say this all the time when we're talking about things that pertain to race, it's just other white, white races, will, they, white people will get the, boys will be boys. Um, they, they're young, they got to grow up. But black men, black girls, they do not get that grace. Because 18 and 19, you're still learning yourself. You're still learning your world. Yeah. So it's not retroactive. Not retroactive. And so that means we have people serving life sentences today under yesterday's drug laws. And that's the part of it that frustrates me. <laughs> you know, like, it's it's really shocks the conscience that right. laws are not made retroactive. It should be a given. I just can't see how it, knowing these facts and looking at the data that you people will come to the conclusion that it's definitely set up against pe black and brown people. Without it, this like you said, it's not even a question. Any that's not yeah. even for debate. It's not up for debate. And I literally have been in conversations with people who don't agree, you know, and I don't even waste my breath. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. I, I wouldn't either. Um, <laughs> another thing with the mandatory sentencing that I saw throughout this book, um, when there were multiple people involved, the whole lying on innocent people. Um, and the go I learned like ghost dope. Yes. I, I didn't even, can you talk about that? I didn't even know that what that term was. It's mind blowing, right? It's enhancement. I just totally, how do you get <laughs> sentenced for something that you might have done or might do? It is so, it's just how the system works. It's so frustrating to me, you know, and I think that empowers me too, to one of your first questions of just how wrong it is. And as you mentioned, the, the lies, it's snitching. Yes. You know, it's snitching in order to get a reduced sentence, but you're you're telling lies. So like in Sharonda Jones's case, 
the drug supplier, so Sharonda Jones was involved in the drug trade. She trafficked drugs for two drug suppliers. She was like a drug mule, if you will, on a handful of occasions. And the drug supplier testified against Sharonda at her trial. The supplier. The supplier. He admitted to trafficking in 150, 200 kilograms of powder cocaine. He testified against Sharonda at trial and got a reduced sentence. He got an 18 year sentence, 19 year sentence to her life. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was never any drugs found on Sharonda. No mm -hmm. surveillance, no controlled drug buys, no photos, no large amounts of cash. Sharonda's, the quantity she was held accountable for was based solely on the testimony of co-conspirators who got reduced sentence. So they never had anything on her, they didn't have any proof. So what do you say to the people that say, you know, well, she did do this. And so, but, you know, justifying it, justifying yeah. her. Yes, all of my clients accept full responsibility for mm -hmm. their actions. You know, we are not the Innocence Project. Right. You know, we they all accept responsibility for their actions. There are consequences that come when you commit crimes, mm -hmm. but it should not be the rest of your natural life. Yes. And there was no, in no shape, form, or fashion should Sharonda Jones have even been sentenced to prison. And yes. my- Based was, on what the supplier said and not anything that on, was found. Exactly. And the fact that she had never been in any trouble before, ever. Right. Rhonda had never even had a traffic ticket before. And so how does that happen? It is mind blowing. You know, part of it is the laws, of course. Part of, course. of it is Rhonda being naive. Mm -hmm. So Rhonda's never consumed alcohol or drugs herself. She's never been inside a jail. Not knowing how the system works. Sharonda Jones utilized her constitutional right to go to trial. Mm. And that was the downfall. Everyone else who testified against her took plea deals. They got reduced sentences. The drug suppliers were out of prison by the time I took on Sharonda's case. After she was 10 years, you know? It been in 10 years. And they were out already. You know, she went to trial, not having a clue what... She didn't even realize what drug conspiracy meant. Which simply means that you just have to have two or more people to agree to traffic in drugs. And so she was sentenced to life. She was sentenced to life. It's just, it blows my mind. I just. Yeah. And can you talk about ghost dope? Yes. So the ghost dope is like, in Sharonda's case, no drugs ever found, no phone calls, no, no physical evidence. <laughs> found. She was held accountable for the drugs that the co-defendants testified she was involved with. So ghost dope is this concept of relevant conduct, if you will, but it, it's just that. It's go dope that doesn't even exist that's coming from the mouths of other people who are getting reduced sentences in exchange for their testimony. And even in Sharonda's case, the drug suppliers testified that she was trafficking powder cocaine for them. Mm -hmm. But the judge comes back and says Sharonda knew or she should have known the powder cocaine was being rocked up into crack and Sharonda Jones was sentenced under the more harsh 100 to 1 crack cocaine penalties. And, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. That's a lot. It's just a lot to absorb. Yeah. Um, if you have any type of humanity or empathy, it's a lot to absorb. It really is. Um, just to think that and a lot in your book, too, you show how people have circumstances. I mean, life happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. And people try, like the, um, the general, I can't remember his name, and I should have wrote it down, but he worked at Kroger. Yeah, Donald Clark. Yes. Mm -hmm. And just talk a little about his, I mean, he worked at Kroger. He had two jobs. And just because the manager was upset with him, you know, just being mean to him, it kind of forced him into his situation. Yes, he lost his job. And losing his job, he got behind. He had, he was young, mid-20s, you know, had bought a, purchased a home. He was married with children. And it put him in such a bind. And so as he was working a second job, that's when he came back in contact with an old high school friend 
who was selling drugs and some extra money to get ahead of his bills. And that's how he started. And it's like a thread with the, all of the cases in the book, actually, like even Sharonda Jones. Sharonda Jones was a single mother. She mm -hmm. was an entrepreneur, but she's an entrepreneur in rural East Texas, you know, with a hair salon. She can't charge a hundred dollars to, to give someone a silk right. press, you know? So, and then this is the early nineties and I'm seeing over and over that one of the, what, what I wanted to help convey in the book as well is that people that I'm talking about in the book were beginning to sell drugs out of a means of survival. Mm -hmm. And that comes across very clear. Yeah, it does. Um, I think you mentioned, I'm not sure if it was, a, it was if it was Terrell uh, in Texas or outside of there where there was a county uh, area that had like 34% of its population was incarcerated because of drugs. Yes. And mostly it was a black community. It was. It was Tulia, Texas. Yes. It was outside. And, you know, when it was one drug bust that incarcerated so many black people, ultimately it was found the police were corrupt, you know, and it, the whole case fell apart, but not after people lost their jobs, not after people had been incarcerated for months, not after people had spent money on lawyers they didn't need, you know. Mm -hmm. People don't understand just the whole systemic oppression that revolves around this war on drugs. And talking about oppression, it brings me to my next point about the criminal justice system and profits. Because you talk extensively about how expensive it is for the families. It fractures the families because a lot of families, you know, they can't travel. It's expensive to travel. Um, you talked about, I didn't even think about that. You talked about the vending machines being expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I knew, I know phone calls are expensive, but it just, it's like they fracture and break the communication between the incarcerated loved one and the family that's left behind. And so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Be and that like hurts more. It's dehumanizing all across the board. You know, I say when one person goes to prison, the whole family goes for prison. And I'm speaking um, from firsthand experience. With my federal cases, people are incarcerated all across the country. So I've had clients like Michael Wilson, who's from Dallas, Texas, who was incarcerated in Victorville, California, yeah. halfway across the country. So when he was in Texas, his mom was able to visit him twice a month. But when he goes to Victorville, he hadn't had a visit in 10 years, almost, you know, and that breaks down the family. Right. So, or even if he is Donald Clark, for example, he really stopped even encouraging his family to come because they were treated so bad mm -hmm. at the front, just going through security or just being dehumanized before they even make it past the gate to go see him. Yeah, you talked about Michael and I was heartbroken. I was happy about his circumstance, but mm -hmm. it goes to the point of not treating people with empathy or any type of humanity. How long had he been in prison? And they let him out on his own in California, away from his family? 22 years. <laughs> and gave him a bus ticket. Gave him a bus ticket. And he could not even read because of the stroke that he had. I was so hurt. By, and I'm sorry, you guys. That, I hope I didn't spoke. I was so hurt behind that because it's like I could feel the uh, family's pain of how did they even find him? He doesn't have a cell phone. And so what What do you do in those instances where they just kind of just put your client on the street? You know, we try to get into gear as fast as possible. And we've had instances where it's happened recently, uh, just the end of 2020, we had a client released from Indiana. We don't know anyone in Indiana. He's from Florida. And so we just sprung into action to get a car service to get to him. You know, and luckily people are understanding more and more how wrong this system is. Mm -hmm. And you know, we are recruiting people from all across the country to be a part of this liberation heist and be conductors on this underground railroad. And the driver escorted him to his flight. You know, he really took the steps yeah. to protect his first steps of freedom. And so if we know a client is getting out, we try to do our best to, to have someone there. Right. To, to be with them. Otherwise, they're just going to get put out in the middle of wherever they are and then 
it's left up to them to find their way back. And I was so worried because I didn't know where it was going. I just kept thinking, oh, my gosh, I hope he doesn't get picked up by the cops and get put back in jail for something. You, you just know how because you just don't know. He doesn't know. He's been in jail for 22 years. And they just kind of put him out. Put him out. And they gave him like a debit card with some of the money he had on his books. But he didn't even know how to use it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. My next, this was, this was another one that was hard for me too, was medical treatment. And just the complete breakdown of just caring for your next, your next man, your fellow man. Yeah. Um, the suffering, the inhumane treatment, you know, objects being left in people from, I, why is women just having improper care? Can we just talk about that for a moment? I just, I'll let you have the floor on that one. Like. One, women are the fastest growing incarcerated population. And there are just not enough programs, empathy, you know, to, to make this process any easier. So Sharonda was incarcerated at a medical facility, mm -hmm. the only medical facility in the federal prison system for women. There's only one. And the level of care that they were giving was nothing short of deplorable. Yeah. So there were people, women, you know, who were miscarrying babies they were carrying when they came to prison and having umbilical cords left inside of them. Mm -hmm. You know, surgeries being botched or prolonged or never even occurring at all when people are in pain. Mm -hmm. The horrors that happen at, at Carswell Medical Facility really, like, there really should be more investigative reporting around that. And they're still functioning? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. There's I mean, still a medical facility for women. Still, oh, there's still a medical facility. And there's only one. There's only one. Something else that struck me in the book, too, was um, Texas. And te I've lived in Texas for several years back in the early 19, 1994, 95. Mm -hmm. And what struck me was that Texas did not have any phone calls. No, not when my mom was there. And she went, she was there from 2006 to eight. There were no phones in Texas prisons. No air, con there's still no air. Con they finally got a phone system in the prison. But my mom was there just as recent as 2006 to 8, 2008, and there were no, there was no phone system. And then no air. Do they, I mean, I know how hot it is in Texas. No yeah. air conditioning? No air conditioning. And so how is this allowed to happen? I, I just, I, and I know it's just, I keep saying that it just sounds so juvenile of me, but I just want to, how is this, no air, and then you have this, and then, the image of I had of slavery picking cotton was this whole what's it called? Whole squad. Whole squad. Can you talk about that? And I'm not I'm not laughing. It's just it's just so asinine to me. It is. It is. And it the first time I saw it was in person when I was going to visit my mom in prison. And the sight was so heartbreaking to me but initially I didn't realize what it was and so I'm super nervous going to visit my mom two and a half hours from Dallas in the middle of nowhere so I'm really intrigued at first by the beauty of the horses because two white men were on these beautiful horses and it just kind of took me out of this anxiety I was feeling as I got closer to the prison but as I got closer to the prison and realized those men on horses were prison guards and they were overseeing women who were slaving in the field, that is what rocked me. And they, the women had, it was probably 16 to 20 women in, in rows, their white prison uniforms with holes over their shoulders where they had been working in the field. I just, I don't think I'm just, I'm not of the belief. I mean, if people do wrong things and they, and they go to jail or go to prison, it, it does not mean that they're not human. Exactly. And so I just, I, this just, it was very eye-opening, very eye-opening. Um, 
can we talk about your clemency work? Because once, I mean, you're like a shero to me. It's like, it makes you want to work. It makes you want to do something. It was just, <laughs> I mean, that's what, that when I finished, I was like, okay, I need, I feel like I need to do something. <laughs> so can you talk about that? The moment when they, I cried, the moment when they called you and told you about Sharonda and just how you, you had the fortitude. You're like, you know what, I'm going to go to the president. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, with Sharonda's case, I didn't have a choice, you know. Mm -hmm. I was determined to get her out of prison. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew that it was going to happen some kind of way, and I learned that there was no avenue to get Sharonda out of prison through the courts because yeah. the laws weren't retroactive, because she had exhausted every remedy. And the, the only way... I learned that she could ever be released was through executive clemency from a president. And at this time, President Obama was in office and he was all of our hope. Like, I'll never forget his inauguration. You know, I was, mm -hmm. a, I was there. Awesome. Yeah. the hope yeah. and some brown face, you know, mm -hmm. being inaugurated that day. And he was the only way that Sharonda Jones was going to be released. And I didn't know anything about clemency at all. You know, I say all the time, I started doing clemency work years ago before it was cool. Mm -hmm. Just learning my way through to really just wanting to ensure Sharonda Jones breathe air as a free woman. I mean, but you, there are so many times in the book where you say, um, I didn't know. Oh, I don't know. But I mean, you persevered. You made sure that you found it out. Like you had mentors that you went back to. And I just, I admire your tenacity. I, I just, thank the, you. Uh, the whole clemency thing. And I, pardon my ignorance, but is the Alice Johnson, the Alice Johnson that, is that the same person? Yes. It is? Okay. Yeah. Like, okay. I don't want to be presumptive. I'm thinking, is that the same person? Okay. So she, her and Sharonda were together. They were. Wow. For years. Sharonda Johnson and Alice Johnson were at the same prison. They're best friends. Oh, wow. And so Alice got on the same thing, correct? Yes, through Dr. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I mean, you're doing so much. Let's talk about your nonprofits. And one of the two of I want to talk really about um, Jim and Buried Alive. Okay. Definitely Jim. Can you tell the audience about Jim? Because I love this. Yeah, so GM stands for Girls Embracing Mothers, and it's a nonprofit that I started eight years ago for girls whose mothers are in prison, and we work to break the cycle of incarceration. Our main programming revolves around these enhanced prison visits. We take girls to visit their moms in prison every single month. We cover a curriculum that revolves around critical life issues, we really provide more than just a visit. We are allowed yeah. to bring food, to eat lunch with the moms. We have art therapy, really working to break the cycle and build the bond between mothers and daughters. And that program is so near and dear to my heart because it totally stemmed from when my mom was in prison. Mm -hmm. And we actually go, our visits are held at the very same prison that my mom yeah. was, you know, so it brings it all full circle. I went on the website and I want to read, you said 49% of women reported that they never see their children while incarcerated. 27% of women reported that they see their children once per year or less. Yeah. Um, Texas ranks 47th, this is good old Texas, in the <laughs> nation and affordability of the 15 minute phone call from prison. Many yeah. counties in Texas have eliminated face-to-face -face visitation altogether. Yes. And so how do you get around all of this? I mean, it's just, it's like you're trying to do good in the world and there's so many barriers in place to keep, I mean, you're trying to keep further fraction of the family. You're trying to, you know, young girls need, kids need their mom. They and, need their mom. Yeah. Right. And so you're doing such a great thing, but there's all these roadblocks in your way. So how do you persevere through that? Yeah, you know, with those statistics, they're so staggering. And so we, I try to do what I can to help fill the gap. Mm -hmm. Like, 
as you mentioned nearly half of the women in prison in Texas never see their children while they're incarcerated. So we try to make sure they see their, their daughters once a month. Mm -hmm. You know, and that consistency, even as we're fundraising and applying for grants, you know, people want to know how many are you serving? What are your outcomes? But some things are qualitative. The fact of the consistency of taking these girls to see their moms every month. When we first started going eight years ago, there was never a dry eye when we would leave the prison. The girls would be crying. It was so emotional. We were crying, the moms. And after about the fourth or fifth visit, no one cried. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling one of our gems, her name is Ariel. She may have been seven at the time. And I said, Ariel, I'm so proud of you. You know, you didn't cry today. And she just kind of shrugged in her nonchalant way and said, we'll be back next month. Yeah, that's, ugh. yeah. So that's, it shows how important that consistency really yes. is. And the mom, the moms are typically the primary caregiver. So mm -hmm. when they're in prison, it's the mom that's taking the kids to see the dad, it's the mom that's holding it down. But when the mom is in prison, no one is taking the kids to see their mom. And it's just something that should be hyped amplify a lot more this right. i love that. i love the work you're doing i'm gonna be all over that page and keep <laughs> up with it and now this very alive i mean you created this with your to your clients yes and so talk i think this is so, i mean it's just like i'm i'm seeing all your praises i can't <laughs> i'm gonna write my review this evening on the book but i just can you talk about the very alive project yes yeah, so the Buried Alive Project is a nonprofit, and we work to free people that are sentenced to life without parole under these outdated federal drug laws. And I co-founded it with Sharonda Jones and Corey Jacobs, who were serving life without parole for drugs. And they both, after serving decades in prison, they both received clemency from President Barack Obama. And, and so one 16 years, 16 life sentences, correct? Corey Jacobs had 16 life sentences. Yeah. And once they were freed, they had like a sort of survivor's remorse, if you will, because they knew that behind people who were just as deserving of freedom as they were. And so we got together and started the Buried Alive Project, where we provide legal representation for people serving life. You know, and so far we've worked to free dozens of men and women who were set to die in prison, who are now living life after life, as we like to call it, and just doing some amazing, amazing things. Yeah. I mean, you are doing some amazing work. And I just want to know, do you ever, do you allow yourself moments to congratulate yourself? And to, because I know you're busy, it's like on to the next thing probably, but just to relish in everything, all your accomplishments, all the work that you're doing, you're changing people's lives for generations. You know, I am working on that. I'm trying to be much more intentional about really processing the victories and accepting my roses now. Yes, and I, I, I would hope that that was like one of my, I, I start that question. So I'm like, I can't just in your writing, I can see how you're just so focused and dedicated. And I'm thinking, I wonder if she's really understanding or just absorbing her victories and what she's doing. You're changing lives for people for many years down the road. I mean, for people that come after them. And it's just such incredible work. Thank you. Yeah. Take your roses now. I mean, definitely. Thank um, you so much. And speaking of Corey, there was one part that I love what he said to you. Um, he stressed you to take care of yourself and to protect your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So if you, whew, I don't know. Let me see what questions we have in here. Oh, good question, Donna. How has COVID impacted your um, gym project? Oh, such a great question. We have not been able to visit the mom since March of last year because prison so that has been devastating for our girls to go with seeing their moms every month. Some of our yeah. girls in the program for eight years. The whole time oh, since inception. Okay. Inception, you know, and they have not been able to see their moms. Some girls have been in the program for the past four years and have not. So they go from seeing their moms every month to not at all. Mm -hmm. So we've had to pivot 
our curriculum to more virtual learning, uh, just Zoom calls with our girls to stay engaged, correspondence programming between the girls and the moms through the mail. We make sure our girls are sending us photos every month so we can send them to the moms because it is tough. It's tough on the girls. As I mentioned, consistency is key. Right. Tough on the moms because they are in Texas, they've been on lockdown almost continuously. There's no outside programs allowed in to program. They aren't been able to call their kids, you know, so they're just stuck right now. And we try to just keep, keep our programming going in a way that keeps our moms and girls connected through this tough time. Because as it looks right now, we don't know when we're going to be allowed to go back. To go back. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Not to mention the um, lack of care that they're getting as it pertains to COVID in those spaces. Exactly. Prisons are like a top five hotspot. Yes. For yeah. They can't distance. How? Right. Let me see if we have another one. Did that come up? Donna, what's the other part? I provide health care and corrective measures. These stories are heartbreaking. How can I can't see the other part of the story? Donna, put the other part of your question. Only half of it came up. Um, so can you share a little bit about if, what you're working on? Are you going to write another book? Um, if you can share any projects that are coming up? Yeah, for sure. I I will likely write another book mm -hmm. more so um, later on. Right now, you know, I've learned and I start to show it more towards the end of the book. You know, I've learned that I can't keep rescuing people from prison and restoring them to poverty. And okay. yes, working on just this economic liberation aspect for all of us. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, like I say to people just because we're in the struggle that doesn't mean we're supposed to struggle. Mm -hmm. I just in that struggle story and I've seen so much genius behind bars that I want to be in a position to help provide capital. So my next venture, if you will, is a, a venture capital fund that I'm about to start to raise a venture capital fund that will fund justice impacted entrepreneurs. So I'll be able to kind of merge my corporate world with my passion to transform the system in a way that's giving people opportunities to thrive and not just merely survive yeah because you're a corporate lawyer right right so. <laughs> <laughs> or like what's wrong with you because i i like my chest gets tight when i'm called a criminal defense lawyer because i feel like an imposter seal sometimes in that space that was one of the questions in the chat i'm um, in the comment someone said you know talking about your background you told about your background and what led you to um, law school but you were a corporate lawyer so you know you talked about finding the the case which made you want to do this work right yeah right oh she wanted to know how do people um donna wanted to know she works you know and with healthcare and with how you impact let me get her question up here how do folks affect change within this prison system? Ooh, that's a big... That's a big question. I think that, for me, people have to find what resonates most with them. This system is flawed in its design. The mm -hmm. whole thing. And just the thought is overwhelming. It is overwhelming. You know, of how do we even begin? And it's overwhelming for me. So much so that I found what was best for me was to pick spe a specific niche. And for me, it was women and girls because of my personal experience with my mom. And it was people serving life without parole for drugs because of my with Sharonda Jones. So I had to like really focus on that so that I don't get overwhelmed because there have been times where it's debilitating for me. Like even the past year, like I'm, just coming out of a space where it's it's more light mm -hmm. you know there were times that it got so bad that i could barely get out of bed i was yeah. so overwhelmed of pe there's so many people that need help yes and it's it's a heavy load to carry and for self-care for to be able to recenter mm -hmm. i think i would advise people to find that issue that you're most passionate about in the system whether it's women and girls whether it's sentencing reform, whether it's preventing youth 
from entering the system, whether it's reentry, parole and probation, like finding an area on the spectrum and working from there because it's gonna take a village. Yes. Someone asked in the comments, what are ways that people can help with your work? Yeah, I wanna know that too. <laughs> supporting us in a way that one I would be remiss if I didn't sit here and say we did help with funding mm -hmm. to any resources of like with our girls for example like we're working to build a curriculum that is virtual that is engaging and innovative so if people have any ideas about curriculum that we could help implement as we are restricted from visiting the moms you know I mentioned starting a venture capital fund so anyone that has experience with that or experience with helping startup entrepreneurs get their businesses off the ground, things like that. If you're a lawyer, have a legal background, we always need lawyers and legal support, you know, and just people just on the ground willing to help as people are released. If you're in a position to hire someone with the background, provide housing, for someone with a background mm -hmm. or know anyone in your network. And part of the most important piece of that, of ways to help is to just, we live in an information age and to be, make sure we're informed, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book too, because the more we're informed, the more we can share with our networks mm -hmm. and, and others just about how morally corrupt the system is. It's beyond morally corrupt. I just can't <laughs> even, I mean, we know this, it's just, I think when you're reading about it and you're reading about real people and how it's impacting real people, it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's maddening. Um, and someone asked, I saw it was in the question. They said, your gym program, would you ever branch it outside to different states? I would love to. You know, I am hoping to, to raise funds. My first state I want to go is like Mississippi or Alabama, somewhere in the South, because in those smaller states, there's typically only one women's prison in the entire state. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that in those states, please reach out to me because I would, even if we just start with once a year, having a mommy and me day, yes, something like that, at least it's a place to start. Um, I would love to expand girls embracing mothers and into other states and, and ideally be able to work ourselves out of a job. Right. Cause yeah. We want to transform the system. But yes, please reach out to me. Yeah, I'm definitely going to remain in touch because I, I, I feel that I'm, I'm just so inspired behind just everything that you talked about. And you mentioned a book that I absolutely love in your book. Which one? Um, the Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace. Oh, my God. Oh, my. I, read, I actually saw Jeff Hobbs when he came to D.C. when the book uh, was released. It is one of my favorite books because I just... If anyone, if you, another book that kind of ties along with this is um, The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace. I was completely floored by that book. Oh, people have not read that book. And A I, lot of people haven't read it. When I, it I, when I saw it in here, I screamed like, oh my God, it's yeah, so good. It really is. And I kept thinking um, when I wrote my review on it and it's just because it got this book, it just, uh, I thought a lot about Langston Hughes' a poem, A Dream Deferred. Yes. Because Robert Peace was a young man who was from Newark um, and went to Yale. Yes. But his circumstances pulled him back, and he just couldn't break the, break the bond. He could not. He could not. And that, that is such a good book. And I know we're, we're winding down on time, and I try not to do, like, spoilers on these, but I have to do this spoiler. Uh, because I talk a lot about Chris Young in my book. I've talked about him today and he was, we were able to get his life sentence removed last September. Did I not, did I see him on your Instagram page? Yes. yes. So it was last September. And then la he had about two years left. And then last week he received clemency, but he's here. Oh my with gosh, please. Oh my gosh. So he's one of the like la last ones in the book that was still in prison. Hi, Hello. how are you? Wow, well, congratulations. Fun. Oh my goodness, this is just so wonderful. <laughs> and how awesome is Brittany? Oh man, she's more than an attorney. She's a guardian angel, a lifesaver, a mentor, a therapist, all of the above. She has made my life tremendously better. I mean, I'm, what a blessing to have her in your life. 
<laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm so yep. glad that you are home. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Brittany, I don't even know what to say. Like, you're going to be, I got through this without crying. Now you have me at the end. You spring <laughs> this on us. But um, keep doing such phenomenal work. I mean, it's just, it's very life changing. It's, it's, it was life changing for me. So you. you'll get tired of me tagging you and all the above, but I'm going to keep my eye out for what's next. And um, I would love to support any way that I can. And Thank I'm sure a lot of people in the chat would as well. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for selecting my book. I was so excited when I learned I was going to be live with you. And so thank you so much. And you know, you know, Debbie Estray? Yes. Oh, that's who reached out to me. Yes. And she I, said, she's because she's one of my friends, and she said, oh, my God, I got this book I want you to read. I said, well, I've heard of the book. She goes, I got I'm going to have them send it to you. <laughs> and I said, oh, my gosh. I said, Debbie, I got to have her on IG yes. Live. So, yeah, I got to thank Debbie for that, too. Deb is so amazing. Yes. She is. So thank you for yeah. your time. I know there's many books out there, and I deeply appreciate you reading mine. So if you guys haven't read it, please get A Knock at Midnight. I put a link down there, but it's in our bookshop as well. And um, thanks again for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. Have a Bye -bye. great week. You too. Bye-bye.